Heaven and hell seem to be two ideas that have made their way through religion and have built fear and anxiety within people. In this video, we want to contrast the scholarly views over heaven and hell versus what the students believe over the topics. In the same way, we will analyze from a psychological perspective how death anxiety is the motivating force behind these views. So while you are watching this video, consider these three questions. Why do we picture heaven and hell the way we do? Why heaven and hell are taught the way they are? And how is death anxiety related into all of these? Belief in heaven and hell is clearly warranted by the Bible. The idea of heaven as the dwelling place of God can be seen in the earliest books of the Old Testament. However, the idea of heaven as a paradise that awaits the righteous did not come about until much, much later. Similarly, the idea of hell could be said to have developed out of the ancient Jewish idea of Sheol, simply meaning grave. Originally, Sheol was thought of as a place for both the righteous and the unrighteous. Later Jewish writings came to talk about it vaguely as a realm of the dead reserved especially for the wicked. In the Gospels, Jesus frequently speaks about heaven in reference not necessarily to a spiritual place, but to the place of God's dominion, or to God's self, as in kingdom of heaven. In speaking of hell, Jesus often refers to Gehenna, an area outside the walls of Jerusalem used for dumping things considered unclean by the Jews, such as animal carcasses. Unclean people, such as lepers, were possibly forced out into this area as well. Though Jesus and later New Testament writers make many references to heaven as eternal bliss in the presence of God and hell as a place of destruction, decay, anguish, and suffering, most scholars agree that the descriptions given by the authors are merely metaphorical. Um, I picture heaven as <clears throat> a nice place above the clouds and it's always bright and everyone's smiling and um, there will be a lot of golf courses and um, well and I guess like the biggest connection I make to heaven is just the people that I've lost in my life are there um, and it's a nice place where everyone's happy I guess. <laughs> I picture heaven as a better version of earth, like a cleaner version of what we see in our daily life. Um, and since I don't believe in hell, I don't really have a picture of it. I don't, I don't think about it. In Marion's interview, she shares that her perception of heaven is a nice bright place located above the clouds filled with smiling faces. This is a commonly shared view of heaven, as is the idea that there will be an element of heaven that relates to your worldly life. Marion hopes for many golf courses in heaven, which shows the anxiety in losing hold of earthly passions once death comes. She also shares her idea that those who she has lost in her life will be in heaven. Again, this exhibits a fear that death causes us to lose all of the things we love, and therefore we create an idea that heaven is a restorative place where we will be given back those things that were stolen from us. In regards to hell, the interviews that we conducted involved the widely accepted ideas of fire, misery, and torture. An interesting response we received was from Laura, who disregarded the concept of hell altogether. It could be argued that this response was cultivated from a fear that her death could end in demise. If a hell filled with despair doesn't exist, then there is no need for anxiousness regarding her existential reality because her only option is the purity of heaven. In the Old Testament, Yahweh is sovereign over all. There is little mention of the devil or demons. In the Gospels, the words devil and demon are mostly synonymous, referring to evil spirits thought to possess a person causing illness in mind or body. Satan is mentioned several times as a kind of archdemon who attempts to frustrate Jesus' ministry. Paul uses many different words and phrases to refer to forces that perpetrate evil in the world such as principalities and powers and ev evil spirits in heavenly places. Hendrik Burkhoff, in his book Christ and the Powers makes the case that Paul is not referring to personal spiritual beings but rather to human institutions and cultures that dominate and control people.
as an all-loving God, the creator of the universe, uh, willing to stretch out his hand to anyone in need and those who are still in a relationship with him, but he continuously always strives for a closer relationship for us as his creation. If we are in a relationship with him or not, he's always striving to get that relationship that he has desired for us. That's why he sent Jesus Christ, so we could have a closer relationship to him and not go all through these like medium boundaries. Satan, I picture him as someone who uh, just always prowling around like a lion, ready to pounce, pounce on prey as the Bible describes. And he finds our weak points and tempts us, gets us with temptation. Um, shame is another thing he uses. He, he just always is bombarding us as Christians and non-believers uh, to do the exact opposite of what God's will wants us to do. I mean, I feel like culture has kind of put a face um, on like Jesus, but I don't know. I guess I picture him. I don't. Know, I don't think I could comprehend like exactly like what he is. If that makes sense. Um, and then Satan. I don't know, just evil. <laughs> The themes of these responses and the others we gathered consisted of the students, um, similar to Daniel, being unable to or avoiding picturing both God and Satan um, physically. Rather, they described what it would be like to experience them and their characteristics. Um, this reveals the idea that God, the all-loving figure, will provide us with feelings of comfort and peace, whereas being in hell with Satan, we would experience suffering, um, and Satan would be very shaming towards us and tempt us in ways um, that are outside of God's will. And this belief coincides with the idea that the fear of death um, and or spending eternity with Satan could be what is motivating our belief systems. The second clip revealed what seemed like a second common theme um, throughout the interviews of not necessarily being able to comprehend what they look like. Um, it seemed as though in each of these conversations the students who were more likely to have vivid descriptions of what God and Satan could be pictured as ascribe that picture to a feeling rather than something that is physical. I think it's more like a spirit. I don't think there's a gender or an age. I think we're kind of ageless in heaven. Because time does not pass the way it passes here. Well, um, kind of as I am now, just with a better body and uh, more importantly, a body that will never die, one that's not subject to decay, not one not subject to uh, to death, um, totally free of all the things that plague my body now. What we notice from Kenya is how we will be in spirit form or spiritual body and how we will be ageless because time does not exist in heaven. And from Dylan, we have the understanding that we will be healthy and we will have a body that will never die. Discussing the idea of being healthy and having a perfect form or perfect body and how we will not experience this corruption that we experience here on earth gives us, gives us the concept of being immortal, which is what we desire. We have this idea of wanting to have the perfect body and have this perfect health because there are life-threatening diseases that can cause health or cause any harm to our body. This life-threatening experience is what causes death anxiety. So to get past this, we need a coping mechanism. We desire perfection, having a perfect body, and not experiencing, not experiencing sickness in any form of corruption that can cause harm to us personally or even cause death. Knowing we can experience this perfection in heaven is what comforts us. We know we can have this perfect health and this perfect body and not experience any pain or any form of suffering to our bodies, and this is what motivates us to have a desire to be in heaven. That's kind of tough to answer, I guess, but I would imagine it as when some, when that, um, like when your last heartbeat um, was there, it's just like your soul basically leaving, um, and then I don't know if you turn into an angel or um, if you like to scare people, you turn into a ghost. I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't believe. I think you just die. There's nothing after. 
Okay, for these two videos, we see two completely points of view over afterlife. In the first answer, we can see how Marian's view over afterlife reflects a thoughtful answer, while well, in the second clip, we can see how Noelia answers the question without hesitation or pauses. Um, although neither of the students seem to be deeply affected by death anxiety or the fear of death, in, in the first in the first clip, um, it seems that um, the girl uses the idea of afterlife as a coping mechanism for um, her anxiety. While in the second video, Noelia um, seems to like face death pretty straightforward and just accept the crude reality of death. With Marian, when she builds a world after life and her emotional stability just starts increasing while she like imagines all these things that could happen after she's gone. Um, while in Noelia's case um, there's no like emotional response. She just um, accepts the fact that she's gonna die and there's nothing gonna um, nothing is gonna happen with her after that. Um, so then this raises a couple of, uh, of questions and it makes us think, how can we tell how deeply people are affected by de death anxiety? And if there are levels in which people can be affected by it, and how we can discover this and measure it so um, we can tell the difference between either summer Christians or winter Christians or people that definitely have nothing to do with religion. Very little is said in the Bible about what one actually experiences after death. The story of Lazarus the beggar and Jesus' words to the thief on the cross seem to suggest an immediate transportation to a heavenly realm. Virtually nothing is said directly about our physical appearance in heaven. The theories of N.T. Wright have gained traction in many theological circles in recent years. Wright, based on his study of New Testament text and the first century Jewish theology, suggests that believers will be with God when they die. However, they will not remain there eternally. God will come to restore the earth, putting an end to death, fear, sickness, and all the corruption that sin brought. Those who believe will be resurrected, much like Jesus was resurrected. Their mortal bodies will be transformed into immortal ones, possibly much like Jesus' body after his resurrection. These immortal bodies will dwell with God, forever enjoying God's restored creation. From the questions we have asked, we conclude that the beliefs of individual people are not necessarily very different from what scripture describes. More so, we have found that individuals have created concrete truths out of vague passages in scripture. We have found also that heaven and hell not only create anxiety and fear, but are also a source of cessation of this death anxiety. We seek out heaven while running from hell in a very circular way. We seek the source of our anxiety to fix our anxiety.